a note to the listeners, episode 32 of No Extra Words contains some explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No Extra Words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Magic Palm by Kevin Brown An angel, grandmother would say, saved her life during a four-story suicide jump the year China went red. Me on her lap, she told how she towed the ledge, stared out at the network of alleyways smothered in smoke and screams and men tearing through men and man-made. How she leaned forward and the landscape fell up, toward and past her. How Quan Shi Yin, the goddess of mercy, appeared and placed a palm beneath her, whispered, The earth shall keep spinning, spin with it, and eased her to the ground. I broke a leg in both arms, she said, raising two gnarled fingers, but it was magical. I'd cry when she told me about Grandfather, whom she hadn't seen since the day he was taken away. He'd been a politician in the nationalist government, and so imprisoned for life. They took my possessions, she said. Then my husband forced me to bow and confess against him to avoid his immediate execution. She'd stare ahead. Last time I heard his voice, he was screaming mine and your mother's names as they drug him away. She'd blink several times, and I could see the image dissipating, melting into the now. We were helpless in a country that needed help, she said, unable to save those who needed saving. Years later, we returned to the location of her old house, but it was gone, replaced by an office building. Grandmother only smiled and said, prettier than it used to be. She died shortly after. As she was lowered into the ground, I asked Mother if she believed a deva really saved her. I don't not believe it, Mother said. I was married later that year, and each time I looked at my husband, I'd think of Grandmother's story. How hard it must have been to have everything one second, and be bowing as it is dragged away the next. How easy it'd be to jump, how hard to climb down. So I mentally recorded my husband's voice, his smells. Behind my eyes, I imprinted his shape and face. Then, on June 4th, 1989, he was killed in Tiananmen Square when a tank rolled between us and has never moved since. A week later, I stood on my own four-story ledge with a bottle of prescription pills, towed the edge, and looked out at my mental vision of the world, a network of alleyways that all led to the same dead end. At everyone, helpless in a country that needed help. I missed my husband, wanted to see grandmother arm-in-arm with grandfather, the memories of forced bows and screams erased forever. So I jumped by swallowing every pill felt the landscape fall up toward and past me until my angel, my goddess of mercy, my grandmother, appeared and placed a withered palm beneath me, whispered, The world shall keep spinning, spin with it, and eased me to the ground where I vomited and it was magical. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. It amazes me, and I have talked about this before because it has happened before, how a program you can put together months ago, stories you can select way in advance, can suddenly feel so applicable to a moment, and never has it been more true than it is today. Um, these episodes in January have been recorded a couple of weeks in advance of their release date. And so I am recording this episode in the week, what I kind of think of as the week of celebrity deaths. And so my husband actually told me that I needed to stop waking him up in the morning by telling him who's died because it's really, he took Bowie's death really hard and it's been, um, a tough one for him. For a lot of us, I think when you lose people, you feel like, you know, because of their art and, Today's episode is not about death. It really isn't. It's about those of us who are left to live life. And um, 
it feels really applicable. And on a personal note, without going into too much detail, I've also spent a ton of time in the last couple of weeks visiting a family member in hospice, which is not nearly as depressing a place as you might think. And so all of this life and death and who gets left behind is big in my world. And as we're watching what's going on around us, big to all of us in the Western world this week, this month. And of course, when you record these things way in advance, you get scared because I don't know what else is coming between now and when the time is that you'll actually press play. Hopefully we've seen the worst of this now and hopefully um, the loss of artists that we've seen will diminish a little bit. So we started with Magic Palm. We're going to conclude this episode with two stories. The first one is Doug and then we're going to close with Evan Guilford Blake's absolutely beautiful Balloon. Balloon is really the story that made me think about Bowie's death and the rights to play a Bowie song are many, many, many times more than my non-existent budget. So it's not coming. But as we close out today's episode, imagine a little bit of Bowie playing. I think that will help with the right mood. You pick the song. My uh, husband gave me a 25 song Bowie mix for a road trip the other day. And it was um, great. Obviously, it's David Bowie. So enough about reflecting on death, which is something I'm not super good at. We also have good news today. We are closing out Contributor Appreciation Month, which means one more of our lucky contributors is going to win a prize. Contributor Appreciation Month is once again sponsored by Chanello.com, C-H-A-N-N-I-L-L-O.com. It's been a delight to work with them. They've been so easy to work with and so generous with our show. And it's been fun for me because as I've been talking them up every week, I've had a chance to explore their site deeper and really think about what I'm reading on Chinillo and find some new stuff. Like a lot of things, not everything on Chinillo is going to be your cup of tea, but they are constantly adding new things. One series that I just subscribed to, haven't even had a chance to start reading yet, and already I'm here talking about it, is The Grey Truth by Stacey Dymalski. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Which has the intriguing premise of an alleged killer who finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time and is accused of murder, decides to make a documentary about the murder he's been accused of. It seems so appropriate to our pop culture right now. And only the first chapter is out. So I get to start with this series at the beginning and read it chapter by chapter as this author chooses to release it. So be sure to check out Chanilla.com and thank them for supporting your favorite podcast. But back to Contributor Appreciation Month, which I'm super excited about. Although it is bittersweet because... This is the last one of these that I get to give away, and it is always hard to say goodbye to things. After this drawing is over, I have to actually return my mixing bowl to my kitchen, dump the papers out of it, and use it for mixing again. But I've noticed in life, as well as in podcasts, it's really important to have things to look forward to. As much as you love your job, it's always easier to do it when you know when the next vacation is. So I've been thinking that way on the podcast, too, as we close out Contributor Appreciation Month of all the good stuff that's ahead. We're going to have a really fun National Poetry Month in April. Poetry submissions are open right now, which means pretty soon I get to start reading those, which will be really fun. And then I'm already planning wonderful things for the spring. I can tell you our 50th episode, which is coming June 1st, is going to be a bit of a party. So there's stuff ahead for us, fun stuff. And I hope you'll keep listening and I hope you'll keep submitting because we will do Contributor Appreciation Month again, I promise. So you want to get on our list of people who've sent us stories. So up comes my mixing bowl. We are so high tech here, I can't tell you. What you are hearing is the sound of lots of pieces of paper with lots of contributor names. And I'm trying to mix it up really good because it's interesting. So far, every winner we've had has been on a forthcoming episode in either February or March. So it'll be interesting to see if we can vary because we've been going with contributors since the summertime. So if we can vary the time frame in which their episodes fell, we'll see what happens here. So what you're hearing is me mixing this up really, really good without knocking anything out of my high-tech bowl. And I'm reaching in and I'm going to pull one out and it is Brianne Holmes. Brianne Holmes, I remember this, Brianne Holmes was on an episode I really liked called Improving the Truth. Improving the Truth was our first episode to feature four short stories by four contributors, four great short shorts, and it really focused on voice and storytelling and Brienne's story going off the rails 
was one a story of probably one of the most epic moves you will ever hear about. So Brienne, if you're listening, congratulations. Shoot me an email at noextrawords at gmail.com and we will talk more about your prize. You are going to be hearing more about all four winners of Contributor Appreciation Month. And let me tell you quickly again who they are. I know this narration is going forever, but again who they are. Week one, Mary Alice Long, whose short story Wild Ones is coming in February. Week two, Sarah Mitchell Jackson, whose short story The Chair is coming in March. Week three, Nels Hansen, whose short story The Silver Horseshoe is coming in March. And week four, Brianne Holmes, whose short story Going Off the Rails was featured back in October. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our contributors. I wish I had a prize to give each one of you. And now, sadly, without the background music of David Bowie, we are going to our next two short stories. I will see you guys in February. Have a great week. Doug by Mercedes Lowry Doug made his way around the world thanks to a substantial inheritance from a distant uncle who had remembered him fondly as a sweet boy with peanut butter breath and polite habits. The habits had not been habits at all, but an act, a forgery, a performance directed by his mother, who was well aware of the uncle's wealth and who'd promised Doug a visit to the amusement park if he would take on the role of a darling child and charm the uncle. Unfortunately, Doug's mother did not live to see her son's financial gain or enjoy what she had expected would be the generous support that would have provided comfort and a removal of undue stress from her days as a senior. The designation of senior, of course, varies, and the benefit of a discount might start as early as 55. Doug's mother was just reaching the point of being able to legally claim a discount at selected venues when she contracted a virus while visiting a neighbor in the hospital and promptly passed away. Doug was fleetingly sad, for he had planned to assure his mother's well-being for a good many years to come. However, he did not succumb to the oppressive level of sadness that is sometimes known as being grief-stricken, and he was quite quickly able to resume the duties of what he jokingly called his profession as a moviegoer. Doug believed he was perfectly suited to this activity and could not have imagined himself as an anything requiring intelligence, good judgment, or people skills. His mother had encouraged him to pursue acting, convinced he harbored a measure of talent evidenced by his portrayal for the uncle. Doug might have been interested if he could have leapt immediately into starring roles, but he was never going to be one of those who paid his dues and played dinner theater or an extra in a sure-to-fail sitcom. In truth, he was lazy, slothful, and not a whit guilty about it. After his travels, all conducted with highly paid assistance at his beck and call, he felt he was ready for retirement. He installed a screening room with a plaque honoring his mother, ordered several dozen pairs of Egyptian cotton pajamas as well as new glasses, and made a hefty donation to the American Film Institute. He was not, after all, a total wastrel. Balloon by Evan Guilford Blake. The day was for shit. Windy, chilly, dank, and overcast. That was apt. There was an 80% chance of rain, according to the Weather Channel, so I wore my lined raincoat. I was still cold, but then I've never been to a funeral where I wasn't. Not even in the summer. Kim says it's an empathetic response. The service was solemn. They are always solemn. Of course I stuck around after everyone else left, holding the bag in one hand like always, and staring at the flowers and the dirt they'd tamped down firmly after they piled it over the box they'd locked him in. To keep him there, which even six feet under was going to be tough, Jay was not a person you kept anywhere he didn't want to be. He was my friend, one of my oldest friends, maybe my closest, and I loved him, Forty fucking two years old. An artist. Always had time for everyone and everything. He was delivering a meal to someone. An old woman who lived alone, no kids, couldn't cook for herself. He didn't even know her, really. 
but three afternoons a week like clockwork. This time it was raining, the car skidded, hit a rail, and... I hate losing people, you know? And I'm at an age where it's happening too often, though most of them are closer to my age than Jay's. It's not just the loss itself, it's the getting past it. Yeah, yeah, life goes on, I know. That's what the service is all about, some kind of closure. But when it's over, I never feel closed. Just closed off, you know? I hate funerals, and I hate cemeteries. I mean, they're all so about... death. I hate death, too. Probably not a particularly reasonable thing to hate, but there you have it. I've never made any pretense of being a reasonable man. Mel and Kim both said I love too hard. Hey, love is love, you know. I don't know any other way to do it. But thank God for Kim anyways. She clarified, I guess the word is, things. When I was in college, this was in the 70s, I had this friend, Melissa. Mel, I called her. Everybody did. The thing I remember most about her was yellow. Her favorite color. She wore it everywhere. We just sort of found each other our freshman year. I don't even remember how. I mean, she was a lesbian, but neither one of us hung around the bars or the clubs. And this was way before the closet door was open, even on campus. We were inseparable. I know, gay guy, dyke chick, but like, hey, I mean, for three years, the only thing we didn't do together was make love. It was our running joke. I even spent a summer with her family on the Virginia shore. That was a trip, being the showpiece so she wouldn't have to charm the local straits and could go out with the woman she loved. Her name was Kim. She was older and really grounded, a zenist, very accepting of the world and people and their places in it. She and I got to be pretty good friends, too, the three of us. We were probably the strangest menage that ever lived. And just before the end of the summer, Mel drowned. In the ocean, maybe a hundred feet out. She must have gotten a cramp, or no one ever knew. But one minute she was there, the next, we, all of us, were devastated. It was like we couldn't stop crying. Except Kim. She was an absolute rock, and at the internment she brought this shopping bag with her. People looked at her, but she ignored them. She stood there the whole time holding it, just silent. And after everyone else had left the gravesite, even the diggers, just the two of us still standing there. She reached into the bag, and she took out two enormously yellow balloons. She gave one to me, and she held hers up. Then she let it go, and it went up, high into the sky, until finally we couldn't see it at all. Then she turned to me and said, Now you. And I let mine go. It rose and flew away. She put her arm around me, and she said, There. Now she's free. So are we. I think about that every time I go to a funeral, like today. Some of the people looked at my bag, at me, like I was, you know, kind of strange. I don't care. Jay was my friend. I loved him. He loved me. You love people. It's hard to let them go. You don't forget them, but you have to let them go. When they were all gone, then I opened the bag. I took out the enormously purple balloon, Jay's favorite color, and looked at it, held by its string. Let it rise above my head. You need to be free, I told him. So do I. I let go of the string. The wind took the balloon. It fairly raced into the gray sky. I watched until it was out of sight. Then I folded the bag and put it and my hands in the pockets of my raincoat and left. The chill was still in the air, and I needed something warm. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.